So in John chapter 15, beginning in verse 16, the Bible reads, You have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you, that you should go and bring forth fruit, and that your fruit should remain, that whatsoever you shall ask of me, the father, of, my, of the Father in my name, he may give it to you. So typically what you'll hear uh, from this passage is normally two types of interpretations where Jesus says that you should go and bring forth fruit and that your fruit should remain. Your fruit should remain. And that's the title of the sermon this morning, uh, fruit, that, uh, fruit That Remaineth, that your fruit should remain, he said there. And typically when people read this, they think, yeah, you know, the, we should have fruit that remains. And a lot of times uh, what they think about is the fact that people should get saved and get in church. In fact, that's probably the more popular interpretation of that. People say, well, it's great that you're going out soul winning. It's great that you're knocking out doors. But do you have any fruit that remains? Do you have anybody that's coming to church and sticking around? And I'm not totally against that interpretation. I think that's a, a valid interpretation. You could definitely apply it that way. But there's also the interpretation, which, which I you know, also believe is correct, is that he's saying there that the fruit that should remain is the fruit that will remain in heaven. He's referring to the eternal security of the believer. He's saying, I, adore, I have ordained you that you should go and that you should bring forth fruit and that that fruit that you bring forth should, should remain. And what we're talking about is the fact that the fruit that we bring forth as Christians might not necessarily be you know, coming through the church doors and sitting down and living the Christian life, but will be in heaven waiting for us. Whether they come to church or not, because, you know, here's the thing. You don't have to go to church to get saved. Yeah. We don't have to have people coming, coming here to, come, uh, to church faithfully and living the Christian life in order to say that we have fruit that remains. Now, I'm not against people that would say, well, you know, we should want that. Because we should want that. We should desire that people will get saved out in the community and come here and learn the things of God and live the things of God and grow in Christ. We want that fruit, too. I'm not against, the, against that type of fruit. We desire to have that as well. I believe both are valid points. But what I don't like is when people use the, 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 the former to kind of, you know, excuse themselves from performing the latter. They'll say, well, you know, the soul winning doesn't work because there's no fruit that remains. Excuse me? It does work. Yeah. Just because you don't see it here. Look, the Christian life is hard. Getting saved is the easy part. Going out and telling people, hey, it's all by faith. You just have to believe. They can do that as simply as eating a piece of bread or walking through the door or drinking a glass of water. Salvation is that simple. Coming to church takes character. Does it take any character to get saved? All you got to do is admit you're a sinner. And some people struggle with that out of pride, I understand. But admit you're a sinner, admit and acknowledge that the Bible's true and that Jesus is God and that he died for your sin. Look, that doesn't take a lot of character. But it takes a lot of character to drag yourself to church, to open up your Bible, to get baptized, to live the Christian life, that takes real character. And quite frankly, a lot of people lack that character, especially today. <clears throat> That's not to say that we don't have fruit that remains in heaven. Just because the church house isn't busting at the seams. Just because every person that we talk to out there and get saved doesn't come running into the church and desiring to know the things of God. <clears throat> You know, being fruitful simply in either interpretation, whether you want to say the fruit that remains is the fruit that gets saved and comes to church, or you want to say the fruit that remains is the fruit that gets saved and, and, is, and is there in heaven abiding, either interpretation, they both have one thing in common. Somebody's getting saved. Amen. You know, being fruitful means winning souls to Christ. That's what it means to be fruitful as a Christian. To bring forth after your own kind, like, like God told Adam and Eve and Noah and and said to go out and, and to be fruitful and to multiply, right? What was he saying? To bring forth after their own kind. You know, we need to do that spiritually. It's one thing that, you know, we should be doing that in our lives, you know, between husband and wife. We should be having children and being fruitful in that area. We understand that. That's another sermon. But we should also apply that to ourselves spiritually. You know, we should desire to go out and be fruitful spiritually. And just because we don't see them here in this house this morning doesn't mean we're not fruitful. And, you know, and by the way, we have seen people that, you know, that have come out from our door knocking. Now, do they always stick? No, because this church isn't for everybody. And I'm not trying to make this church for everybody. There's plenty of churches out there that will be all things to, to everybody. And they'll, they'll teach, you know, that's, you know, I don't want to go off on that. But this isn't that church. But to sit there and to say, well, that, this church isn't fruitful then, because we don't have that, that that's not true. Because of the fact that we're doing that which is required to be fruitful. Are we going out and winning souls to Christ? Absolutely. 
So we're being fruitful and we have fruit that remains. Go over to, uh, go over to Romans chapter 7. Romans chapter 7. The Bible says in Proverbs chapter 11, The fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and he that winneth souls is wise. The fruit of the righteous is a tree of life. Now, who's the righteous this morning? That's me and you. We're the righteous, right? We're made righteous in Christ Jesus. Amen. You know, we have his righteousness. We are the righteous. Not self-righteous, not our own righteousness, but we understand that we are righteous. Now, what is the fruit of the righteous? What's, what's our fruit this morning? It's a tree of life. I mean, you think about it in, 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 you know, in real, real world terms. You know, a tree, what's the fruit of a tree? It's an apple. But what is the apple? The apple is just a, a, you know, a means by which a seed is carried to the earth and another tree springs up, right? That's what fruit is. It's just, a, it's just seed. You know, it's, it's the fruit-bearing seed. That's how it reproduces itself. It's through the fruit. Look, our fruit, the fruit of the righteous, is a tree of life. The fruit that we should desire to have is another righteous tree. Now, how do, you, how do you make that happen? By going out and winning souls. That's why it says, and he that winneth souls is wise. Because he's going to be fruitful. <coughs> Doesn't, you know, and, and we could say, we, look, we want to be fruitful in that we want souls to be one, and then, and then they should come here and be just like us. That'd be great. But that's, that's not to dismiss the fact that even if we just go out and, 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 and win souls to Christ, that we are fruitful. You know, we have, we have planted that seed. That seed has taken root in the earth. It has sprung up. Now, whether that person wants to nourish that and cultivate that and cause that to grow, that's on them. Whether or not they want to grow as a Christian, that's on them. I'm not going to be one of these people that tries to twist arms to get people to come into church. Because here's the, th here's the thing. People, when you have to carry people, this is what I found, when you have to carry people in the Christian life, wherever you put them down, that's where they stay. Or a lot of times they just go, oh, right back. Well, you're done carrying me? Well, I'm just going to go back to where I was then. Well, let me pick you up again and drag you along. You know, people that get out of church, I, you know, <laughs> maybe, maybe I'm, I'm, I'm shooting myself in the foot by saying this, you know, I'm not going to hunt you down. I'm not going to come track you down. And, you know, I might call you in, out of love just because I love you as a brother in Christ and say, hey, just checking up, seeing how you're doing. But I'm not going to be, you know, uh, the deacon or the preacher that's going to, you know, show up on your doorstep and be like, why haven't you been in church? I already know why you're not in church. <laughs> you know, I already know why. And I don't have to go and rub your face in it. If you want to get back in church, here we are. <clears throat> what I'm trying to say is this, is that, you know, I'm not going to be one of these people that tracks people down because I don't have to have people here filling the pews to feel like I'm a fruitful Christian. You know, if I'm going out and sowing the seed and I'm planting the seed and people are getting saved whether they come or not, I know that that fruit is going to abide. All, and when I get in heaven, there'll be a harvest. You're there in Romans chapter 7, look at verse 1. It says, I know, uh, know ye not, brethren, for I speak unto them that knoweth the law, how that the law hath dominion over a man as long as he liveth. For the woman which hath an husband is bound by the law to her husband so long as, she, as he liveth. But if the husband be dead... She is loose from the law of her husband. So then if while her husband liveth, she be married to another man, she should be called an adulteress. But if her husband be dead, she is free from the law, so that she is no adulteress, though she be married to another man. So he's using this as an illustration for salvation, right? He's, he's likening the, the law. You know, we were married unto the law, but now the law, the old covenant, has been broken, and we're married unto Christ, okay? He says in verse 4, Wherefore, uh, my brethren, you are also become dead to the law by the body of Christ, <clears throat> that you should be married to another, even to him that was raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. So there again, we see this phrase about bringing forth fruit unto God. God desires that we would bring forth fruit and that our fruit would remain. Now, how do you bear that fruit? How do you bring forth after your own kind? He says in verse 5, For when we were in the flesh, the motions of sins which were by the law did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. But now we are delivered from the law, that being dead wherein we are held, that we should serve in newness of spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. In order to bring forth fruit, you're going to have to serve. And what is that service? It's soul winning. 
It's more than just the Christian light. Living, it's, of course, all these things, you know, being fruitful in our marriages, being fruitful in our child rearing, being fruitful in our Bible reading, being fruitful in all these other areas. But that's all service. You know, and that's why a lot of people don't have fruit, because it, it requires service. It's work. You don't believe me? Come on out this afternoon. You know, it's been raining. It's going to be nice and muggy. <laughs> it's going to be work this afternoon. You know, we're going to have to eat, we're going to have to drink, we're going to have to go out there and pace ourselves and get the work done, the work of the ministry. But we bring forth fruit by serving. And that just goes to show me that, you know, if we're going out and doing the work, if we're serving, then we're bringing forth fruit. And whether that fruit is here in church or waiting for me in heaven, that fruit will remain. <coughs> I mean, would we, are we to believe only that only those that come to church and go on to live for Christ count as fruit that remains? Some people would have you believe this. Some people would have you believe, well, you know, if people don't come to church and get baptized, you know, if you get someone saved, you get a convert, and, but if they don't follow Christ, that fr that's not fruit that remains. I disagree with that. I, I, I would say, I understand where you're coming from. I'm not saying I don't desire people to come to church, and we could probably all work better at that, and, you know, following up where appropriate, you know, if there's somebody that seems genuinely interested, that's another sermon. I'm not against that. I'm not against people coming to church, but I'm not going to sit there and say, well, if they don't do it, then we don't have any fruit. I don't believe that. And we could look at several examples. How about the example over in Acts chapter 1? Go over to Acts chapter 1. <coughs> we could look at the, uh, uh, the examples of Christ's ministry, Paul's ministry, and we could see that, you know, the fruit that they had didn't always stick around wasn't there every, every moment that they could be there. wasn't there to learn all the things of Christ. Look at Acts chapter 1. I mean, think about Acts. This is right after, you know, Christ has ascended into heaven and he's commissioned the 12 disciples, or the, the, rather the, the, the many that were there, the 70, to go out and to preach the gospel to every nation. And they've got, you know, but this is after Christ's ministry. This is right after it. Where throngs of people, where this whole nation has heard about Jesus, they've all, they've all, been following him and he's been feeding thousands on multiple occasions he's been doing all these miracles his fame has just spread ab abroad throughout all the land over the course of those three years but what do you find in acts chapter 1 verse 15 it says and in those days peter stood up in the midst of the disciples and said the number of the names that were uh, get to another of names together were about 120 you're telling me that's all you got 120 now look 120 is a good sized church these days, you know, the average church size in America, I think, is 50. You know, in independent Baptist churches, it's probably even less than that. But here, Jesus, I mean, the Lord himself, when he leaves earth, when he goes back to heaven and says, all right, get to work, church, there's 120 people there. Oh, I guess he didn't have much fruit that remained then, did he? That's what some people would have you to believe. Some people would say, well, I mean, if every person that Jesus didn't get saved wasn't there, to hear what Peter had to say that day, then you know what? He must not have had any fruit. What about the example of the twelve? Go over to John chapter 6. <laughs> We're just looking at some examples in Christ's ministry. You know, where there was fruit, but it didn't necessarily always stick around. Look at uh, uh, John chapter 6, verse 65. And he said, Therefore I say unto you, I said unto you, that no man can come unto me except it were given him a, a, unto him of my father. From that time, many of his disciples went back. They were there to hear the preaching, and they didn't like it. And they went back and walked with him no more. Then said Jesus unto the twelve, will you also go away? So he had a group of twelve with him. Oh, I guess Jesus wasn't very fruitful then, was he? Boy, it didn't seem like that fruit stuck around. And, you know, this is a great example of a lot of times what we see in ministries like this that go out in the community that, you know, preach the gospel, encourage people to come to church, get baptized and learn. A lot of times, sometimes people do come. They come for a few services. And then they realize these guys aren't playing games. They really mean it. They really expect you to, you know, walk the walk around here. They say have hard sayings like this, like Jesus said, because they're preaching the whole counsel of the word of God. And they say, you know what? I think I'm going to go over to my relative's church where it's more of a rock and roll concert. Well, there were, it's more about the purple lights and the smoke and, or that gets, well, maybe there is some smoke. I don't know what's going on these days, but, you know, the smoke machine. 
the big screen and everyone's just going to wave their arms for 30 minutes and, and it will feel good and there's just only there's only one service a week we can you know no one's expecting anything out of me that's where I'm going to go and then, then we're left what the, with the 12 right and praise God there's more than 12 here this morning <coughs> but I'm just pointing out these examples to show you that look even in Christ's own ministry you want to say the fruit didn't remain would we say that of his fruit well, must not have remained, must not have been real. No, it's in heaven. Amen. How about the example of the nine? Go over to Luke chapter 17. Luke chapter 17. Look at verse 11. It says, And it came to pass as he went to Jerusalem that he passed through the midst of Samaria and Galilee. And as he entered into a certain village, there met him ten men that were lepers which stood afar off. And they lifted up their voices and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. And when he saw them, he said to them, Go show yourselves unto the priests. And it came to pass that as they went, they were cleansed. And this, this is salvation, folks. It's a great picture of salvation. They're crying out. They're calling upon the name of the Lord. And He's giving them His word. Go show yourself to the priest. They act on faith. And they start to go. And as immediately as they go, they're cleansed. It's a perfect picture of salvation. Leprosy is a picture of sin. But they had to stand up and just trust Jesus' word. That, hey, if I just take one step towards the priest and go do what He says in faith, that I'm going to be cleansed. That's what they did, and they were clean, cleansed in that, that moment. So there's a great picture of salvation. You, that, and then we would, you know, some people would say, well, obviously, if that fr that's fruit that remains, you know, those ten guys, those ten lepers are going to show themselves a priest and immediately go find Jesus and follow him and hang on to his every word and do everything that he said and be perfectly obedient. Is that what people would have us to believe today? Some people would. But is that what happened in the story? It says in verse 15, And one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back. One, just one of them. And one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back and with a loud voice glorified God and fell down at his, fate, at his feet, giving thanks. And he was a Samaritan. And Jesus answering said, Well, I'm glad at least I have one piece of fruit that remains. I guess the rest of those other nine were just a bunch of phonies. He said, we're not ten, There are ten cleansed, but where are the nine? And that's kind of the, the criticism that we often hear. Well, where are they all? Where are all these people that are getting saved in your ministry? Well, I'll answer that more thoroughly in a minute, but here, here's an example of where they might be in another church. Sitting on their lazy backside watching you know, football or something on Sunday afternoon, Sunday morning, not getting out to church. That kind of thing happens. He says, we're not the ten cleansed, but where are the nine? They are not found that return to give glory to God, save this stranger. And he said unto him, Arise. I love this part. Arise, go thy way. So the one guy that comes back, Jesus says, Get out of here, buddy. <laughs> and so I'm glad you're here. Make sure you stick around and validate my ministry. Make sure you stick around and everybody that comes to pay me a visit, I can show them. Say, Oh, look, I got fruit that remains. I'm real. He says, Arise, go thy way. Thy faith hath made thee whole. The one guy that comes back, he says, Take a hike. Where were the nine? Well, were the nine unsaved because they didn't return? No, they were saved the minute they stood up and walked towards that priest. And it's interesting, you know, that the one that comes back, he tells him to go thy way. And I ask you, is Jesus unfruitful here? No, it's just that his fruit is in heaven, just like ours. We looked at several examples in Jesus' ministry. Let's look at another one in Paul's ministry. You go over to 2 Timothy chapter 4. Paul's going all over, the, you know, all over the world, preaching the gospel, all these nations, starting churches. No doubt you could say he had fruit that remained in the sense that it went to church. You could say that, and I believe that's, that's right. But he also had fruit that you know, turned back on him, that went away. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 10. He says, For Demoth hath forsaken me, having loved this present world. Well, just invalidated your ministry. You mean you tell me somebody would love the present world and, and, and fall out of church and, and or maybe never come to church to begin with? Happens all the time. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 1. 2 Timothy chapter 1. Look at verse 15. This thou knowest that all they which are in Asia be turned away from me. All they that be in Asia be turned away from me. Must not be a real minister. Must have the wrong gospel. Because after all, if he was real, if he had the real gospel, everyone in Asia would be in church with Paul every chance they had. They would just embrace Paul and his preaching and everything he had to say. He said, no, 
We, none of us this morning would question Paul's authenticity. None of us would question the fact that he was a real man of God that was bringing forth fruit. But even he had instances in his ministry where all they which are in Asia were turned away from him, of whom are, are Phygelus and Hermogenes. The Lord give mercy unto the house of Onesiphorus, for he oft refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chain. But when he was in Rome, he sought me out very diligently and found me. You know why some people aren't always where the man of God is? They aren't always where the preaching's going on? Because it takes diligence. It sounds like the Anisiphoruses of the world are in the minority. Everybody in ages turned away. You know, Philegius, Hermogenes, they're with them. They've all turned away from me. But there's this one guy, just this one guy, Anisiphorus, who sought me out what? Very diligently. It takes character to be in church takes character to be where the preaching is. You say, well, it doesn't seem like it. All I'm doing is sitting here. <laughs> but hey, if you're in a real church, if you're a church where they're really preaching the Bible, you know, it takes character to come in there and say, some Sundays, I'm probably going to have to come in there and take it on the chin. Something's going to come right down the pike and hit me square in the jaw, and I'm going to have to deal with it. A lot of people, they, they don't have the character to handle that. They, they drop out. They go away. Or they start to hear the preaching, they say, well, I've got to make some changes. And then they're brought to a place of decision. They say, well, I'm either going to make these changes or I'm going to go put myself through misery every Sunday. Well, there's another option. I'm not going to make any changes. I'm not going to go put myself, you know, have myself preached out every Sunday. I'm just going to get out completely. Because it takes diligence, it takes character to be in the house of God. And it sounds to me like they're fewer and far between. The Anisiphoruses of this world are in the minority. And we get that criticism sometimes. You know, I'll tell somebody, hey, you know, we're a soul-winning church. Our goal is to knock every door in Tucson. Our goal is to help knock every door in the state of Arizona and preach the gospel to every creature, which is a command of the Bible, by the way, Amen. which is the last thing that Christ told us before He left this earth was go and preach to every creature, teaching them all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And we're trying to fulfill that. And people go, well, do you have any fruit that remains, though? To which I reply, look around, buddy. And if you're here this morning wondering if we have any, look, any fruit that remains, why don't you look to the left? Why don't you look to the right? And I'll show you some fruit that remains. It's you. It's like, <laughs> don't, you, don't, don't these people count? Don't you count as fruit that remains this morning? I mean, everyone in this room, somebody preached the gospel to them. A lot of folks in this room, they heard of this church and, and Pastor Anderson and that, and that preaching. I mean, how many people here got saved through Pastor Anderson's preaching? You know, half the room. Well, half the room. And here you are, fruit that remains. Right? And people would say, oh, I don't know. It doesn't seem legit to me. Well, look around. But here's the thing. You know, our fruit isn't just here on this earth. Our fruit, I believe, is in heaven. Go over to Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter number 1. The Bible says in Colossians chapter 1, verse 1, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, and Timotheus, our brother, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ, which are at Colossae, grace be unto you, and, priest, and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, we give thanks to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you, since we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus, Jesus and the love which you have to all saints, for the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, whereof you have heard before in the, wor in the word of truth of the gospel, which is come unto you as it is in all the world, and bringeth forth fruit, as it doth also in you since the day you heard of it. So what's bringing forth fruit here? The word of the truth of the gospel brings forth fruit and that fruit is laid up in heaven go over to Philippians chapter 4 Philippians chapter 4 look the gospel brings forth fruit does, it, is, is, does the gospel bring forth fruit only in the sense that it gets people in church the gospel brings forth fruit in the sense that it gets people saved Amen. that is the fruit of the gospel Look at Philippians chapter 4, verse 14. Notwithstanding, you have done well that you did communicate with, me, with my affliction. Now he's talking about communicating here. He's talking about giving financially, supplying Paul's need for the ministry. 
Now ye Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church communicated with me as concerning giving and receiving, but ye only. So he's saying, look, when I left Macedonia, you guys were the only ones that gave to me. He says, ye only. He says in verse 16, and for even in Thessal Thessalonica, so get the picture here. He's, he's, this is written to the Philippians. So he's writing to a church in Philippi. And he's talking about when he left Macedonia and went into Thessalonica. Okay, so he's talking about this instance where he's in Thessalonica and the Philippians are in another city, you know, Philippi. He said, for even in Thessalonica, ye sent once and again unto my necessity. He said, look, I was all the way over in Thessalonica and you communicated unto me concerning giving and receiving. Not once, but more than once. He said, not once. He said, you sent once and again unto my necessity. So they're sending and nobody else is communicating to them. No one else is supporting his work. Nobody else is, you know, help is you know, for whatever reason, they're not able to, they don't do it, whatever. But he's saying, look, you did. Those of you in Philippi, you Philippians, when I was over there, you communicated unto me. And he said in verse 6, 17, now, 17, now pay attention. He says, not because I desire a gift, but I desire fruit that it may abound to your account. He's saying, look, I wanted, I wanted you to support me. And I wanted you to give. I'm glad that you did. Not because I want a gift from you, because I want to work on your behalf. Where? In a completely different city. He said, you're all the way in Philippi. I'm in Thessalonica. You're communicating unto me. And I'm here working, doing the work of the Lord. And that fruit that I, er, that I uh, win to Christ is fruit that's going to be uh, accounted unto them. It's fruit that's going to abound to their account. Now, how is it going to abound to their account? Because everybody that gets saved in Thessalonica is going to say, well, it, hey, you know, if, if the Philippians are the ones that are supporting Paul, we need to go to church there. Is that, is that what's going on here? Is that what he's talking about? When he says, well, the fruit that's going to abound to your account. Well, it's obviously because everyone that got saved in Thessalonica, you know, packed up and moved to, 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 Phil, uh, to, the, to Philippi and started going to church there. No. Do you, do you get what I'm saying here? You're picking this up? He's saying, look, it's abounding your account because I'm winning them to the Lord because of the financial support that you gave. They're getting saved and going to heaven, and that's abounding to your account because of the fact that you've given to me to be able to go and do this work. You know, which is a, you know, another principle there that you know, when we give to somebody, a missionary, you know, a missionary who's actually doing the work, you know, these mission, not a moochinary, which is you know, just running rampant in, in the IFB world. People that are going to foreign countries don't even speak the language. Well, I'm going to go there and learn the language and then start winning souls. You could do so much. I mean, the state of the modern missions and, and, and the way they do things in the IFB church is just, it's, it's stupid. I, mean, I can't think of a better word for it. It's dumb. Why don't you go somewhere where you can you know, win souls to Christ from day one? You know, learn the language and then go there. How about that? There's a good idea. <laughs> but what I'm trying to say is this. When you actually have a missionary who actually goes and does the work of the Lord, doesn't just invite people for dinner for six months and then tries to start talking about the Bible, but actually goes out and knocks the doors and preaches the gospel and gets souls saved. When you give to that person, that is fruit that is abounding to your account. I believe that. You're going to get to heaven and God's going to say, oh, well, I see here on the ledger that you gave so much and that enabled so-and-so to go out and win these souls to Christ. You know what? That's fruit to your account. And, that, and most people understand that in, in Baptist churches and that's what they think is going on when they put their money in a plate that goes to a missionary. They'd be shocked to find out probably what's really going on. The guy's just sitting over there hasn't won a soul to Christ in years sometimes. Just wasting God's money. Wasting God's, God's people are working hard, going out, putting in the hours, putting money in the plate, thinking, I'm, I'm winning souls to Christ in a foreign land. No, you're not. That guy's over there just wasting it. Wasting his time, wasting your resources. Well, look, if you found a real one, if you found somebody who's actually doing the work, that's fruit to your account. Why? Because those are souls that are going to heaven. Not because Paul's going to get him saved and send him on a train back to Philippi. So they can go to church and be counted as fruit that abounds, that abides. <clears throat> so our fruit is guaranteed to remain, not just because, you know, not just in the sense that 
it's going to come to church. You know, people that we get saved are going to come to church and stick around. Look, I'm all for that. You know, and I've been trying to think of things. Hey, how can we help the church grow? You know, me and several of the men have talked about this. What can we do? What kind of programs can we do? How can we get more involved? What, you know, what, what things can we do? And ultimately, you know, Jesus said, I will build my church. And we just need to be faithful and not, and not get so hung up on numbers. But people get so hung up on numbers. You know, they, they say, well, you know, if this church isn't big enough, then obviously it's, there's nothing going on here. But that's not how it works with God. God's not impressed with numbers. And I'm all for numbers. I'm not against having a, running a big church down here. But I don't have to run 400 people in this church to feel like this church is a success. Yeah. You want to know how I'm going to measure the success of this church? Go look at that map. Mm-hmm. You know, when you're doing that with the amount of people that we have, that's impressive. And I guarantee you when Pastor Anderson comes down here this week and when Pastor Mia pays a visit, they're going to look at that map and they're going to go, wow, they're actually doing something down in Tucson. And they're not going to be like, well, how many, what's your average Wednesday night attendance? Do <laughs> you have any fruit that remains? Look, our fruit is going to remain. I, you know, it's guaranteed because Christ has ordained that it will. <clears throat> If you would, go over to Luke chapter 8. We'll start wrapping it up here. Luke chapter 8. Look, if I'm abiding in Christ, I'm going to produce fruit. That's a given. That's what he said. He said, I have, I have ordained that you should go and that your fruit and bear much fruit and that your fruit should remain. He said, I have ordained it. That he's, what he's saying there is like, look, if you, go in a, if you go and bear fruit, it will remain because I have ordained that it will remain. And why will it remain? Because when a person gets saved, they're eternally sealed. They're, they're never going to perish. They're going to, oh, they're, that's what God has ordained. He's not saying make sure that, I'm trying to express this in a way, hopefully I'm making myself understood. He's not saying, look, bear fruit, but make sure your fruit remains too. You know, I want you to do both. He's saying, look, if you bear fruit, it will remain. Because I have ordained that it will. Because of the fact that once you're saved, you're always saved. You don't have to win that fruit. You have to win somebody Christ, bear fruit, and go back. Well, I've got to make sure that's still fruit. I wonder if that fruit rot, you know, has, has rotted and gone away. It's unsaved again. No. He said, once you get them saved, I guarantee you, it's guaranteed. There's no expiration date on that fruit. It's going to abide forever. That's what he's saying here. He's not, he's, he's not saying, bear fruit and make sure it's the right kind of fruit that remains. You, know, and you have to make sure that it remains. Look, the burden of it remaining is his responsibility. This is, a, this is a guarantee that he's giving us in John chapter 15. This is a promise. Not so much, it's, a, it's a command and a promise, both. He's saying, look, you need to go bring forth fruit. <laughs> he's or, but he's also ordained, he's ordained that we should go bring forth fruit, but he's also ordained that when we do that, it will remain. That's what he's saying here. And we have that promise because we know that if we abide in the vine, we will bring forth much fruit. So when someone says, you know, well, I don't know that you're really bringing forth any fruit, then you're telling me that I'm not abiding in the vine. You're telling me I'm not walking in the Spirit. You're telling me that I'm not doing God's work, that I'm not doing, that I'm not obeying His commandments. Is that what you're saying? Because if I do abide in the vine, if I do keep His commandments, I shall bring forth fruit, and that fruit God has ordained will remain. Look at Luke chapter 8. Look at verse 13. He said, they on the rock are they which when they hear receive the word with joy and these have no root. Which for a while believe and in time of, in time of temptation fall away. And that which fall, fell among thorns are they which when they have heard go forth and are choked with the cares and the riches and the pleasures of this life and bring forth no fruit to perfection. So he's saying, of course, the parable of the sower. The sower goes out and sows the seed. It falls on three different types of ground. And he's saying, look, this, this second type of ground, it says that when it falls among thorns, those are the type of people that get choked out by the cares and the riches and the pleasures of this, of this life, and they bring forth no fruit to perfection. But here's my question. Are those people still fruit themselves? They are, right? They are. The seed that falls on the thorny ground is still somebody's fruit. If I go out and I sow seed, right, and some of it falls by the wayside and the, the, ra- the fowls of the air come and snatch it away before have time to take root in the earth. Okay, those are people that hear the word, but they don't get saved. Okay? But if I go and I sow seed and it falls on the thorny ground and it takes root and it begins to spring up, that's fruit. Right. 
And that's, that, that per this, sa this person is saved. You're never going to convince me that's an unsaved person in this passage. That's the amount of person who gets saved. But the problem with that person is they get so caught up with the world, the cares of this life, and so on and so forth, that they themselves never bring forth fruit. They never go out and, be, and, and, and uh, you know, win souls themselves. They never go cast seed. They're choked out by the cares of this life. But they themselves are still, are still fruit that I have sown. Does that make sense? And I'm telling you, there's a lot of that out there in the world. Because there's a lot of cares, isn't there? There's a lot of riches. There's a lot of pleasures of this life. There's a lot of people that are saying, you know, the whole living for God thing, sorry, it sounds nice, but I've got too much sin I want to enjoy. Sunday mornings, I've got a lot of other things I'd rather be doing. Wednesday, you know, Thursday night, Wednesday night, whatever, no thanks. They get choked out. There's nothing wrong with the seed. It's the same word, right? What's the problem? The problem is the soil. And the problem with the soil isn't that it can't bear fruit itself. It's that there's too many other things growing in it. The seed's good, the soil's good, it's just these people are the type of people they never clear out the underbrush and allow that seed to, to really bring forth in their life. But they themselves are still fruit. They're just choked out. They're just not... They're the person that we get saved. I mean, they get saved, but they never get in church because they're too busy with everything else in life. They're the person that gets saved but never desires to live for God or to serve God because they get choked out by the cares of this world. But they're still fruit. And there's still fruit that's going to abound. There's still fruit that's going to abide unto life eternal. And that's still fruit that is going to be, you know, marked towards my account or your account if you're the one that wins them. <coughs> he says in verse 15, But that on the good ground are they which with an honest and good heart, having, he having heard the word, keep it, and bring forth fruit with patience. And that's the difference right there, isn't it? It's like that guy, uh, you know, Onesiphorus, who had to seek out Paul very diligently. He had to go to this guy and that guy. Is he here? Is he there? He couldn't just check Paul's Facebook status. You know, where did he check in last? Share your location. You know, back then you had to, like, track people down. It might have taken days, weeks, months to find somebody. You might never find him. <laughs> you just might never find him. It took diligence. And the people in this passage in Luke chapter 8, those that are going to, you know, bring forth fruit, are they going to do it with patience? It's going to take, again, what? Diligence, character. And that's why there's a whole lot of, that's why that, they're in the minority, again, like in Nisiphorus. There's less of this type of person in the world. Unfortunately, but that's just the way it is. You know, so people who want to turn to John chapter 15 and use it as a criticism of soul winning, ought to tread very lightly, especially around me and especially in this church. And, you know, if you want to use John 15 as, as a wet blanket on soul winning, this isn't the church for you. Because this is a soul winning church. That's what we're about here. That's what we're going to do. We're shading that whole map red. I don't care if it's with just the people in this room or, you know, twice as many or half. We're going to get it done. <clears throat> Go over to Matthew chapter 4. And you know what's funny about that is, is, is people who, 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 wanna, who are most concerned with the authenticity of salvations, people who are most concerned of whether or not people are really getting saved out there through your efforts, are often the people who are sowing the least amount of seed. <laughs> they're the ones who aren't, they're not doing, it's like, okay, well, you know, since, you're so, since you have such a firm grasp of what fruit is, what it means to have fruit that remains, show me yours. Show me yours. People want to throw a wet blanket on soul winning. They want to criticize soul winning. It's like, I love this phrase. You know, don't tell me about it. Show me. If I'm doing it wrong, you show me how it's done. I mean, because I've got a Bible that says go. It says daily in the, in the temple and, and from house to house, they cease not to teach and preach Jesus Christ. And I've got a Bible that tells me they're, they're going to every creature What's the, what's the best way to go to knock or to, to, to visit every creature, to preach the gospel to every creature? It's to go find every creature and preach to them. And where you can find most creatures? In their house. Because I don't care how busy they are in life, at some point everybody goes home. Sounds to me like going to somebody's house and knocking the door and trying to preach them the gospel. That's a pretty effective means. 
And people have a lot of different ideas about how to reach people for Christ. And, you know, I'm not against those, but I'm, I'm, I have a hard time believing there's a better way of doing it than going door to door. It's not the crusade. Well, we're just going to get everybody together all at once and preach to them one time. It's not going to work. You say, well, you know, it's, it, it, are, we, are we really going to get everybody saved going door to door? No. But that's why we need to get this through our heads. We need, to go to, we need to knock every door in Tucson, and then we need to do it again. And then we need to do it again. What did God that we knocked every door in Tucson every year? And every person in Tucson, I mean, it got to the point where they're just sick of us. You know, and this, this, hap this is possible. This is what people are like, oh, that's crazy. This is possible if you had people that, you know, if you had less people who were critical of soul winning and just wanted to get involved in the program and help. My wife was just telling me the other day about when she went out soul winning in a neighborhood near Faithful Word up in Tempe. And she got this lady saved. And this lady, she said, oh yeah, you guys have been here before. She brought out like a stack of invites that had been left in her door. Like four or five invites. You, I've talked to you guys before. And that my wife was finally the one that got to, you know, some watered, some planted, you know, but God brought forth fruit that day. He's the one that gave the increase. And she was, she was the one that got to do that. But you know what that tells me is that that's what we need to have here. And we have this goal to say, well, let's just knock every door at least once. And that's great. That's a big work. But you know what? We really need to knock it once, twice, three, four, five. I mean, it's just, we need, you can't do it enough. And it works. Are you in Matthew chapter 4? Matthew chapter 4? Let me read you from Matthew chapter 12. It says this. He that is not with me is against me. And he that gathereth not with me scattereth abroad. That is a heavy saying from Christ. And people really ought to let that sink in, what he's saying here. He said, he that gathereth not with me scattereth abroad. And people get this idea in their head, they get this idea that, well, when it comes to this thing of soul winning, I can just be neutral. But he says, he that gathereth not with me scattereth abroad. Look, if you're not gathering with him, you're, it's not, you're not at zero. You're actually in the negative. You're scattering abroad. I, I can't explain exactly what he means by all that. Maybe you can think on it. <laughs> Maybe I don't have to think about it much because I'm busy, you know, I'm busy gathering. So I have to concern myself with scattering. But look at Matthew chapter 4, verse 18. He said, And Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brethren, Simon called Peter and Andrew his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. And he saith unto them, Follow me, and I will make you a fisher, make you fishers of men. And straightway they left their nets and followed him. He said this, Look, follow me, and I will make you a fisher of men. He didn't say, Follow me, and you know it's optional. You know, follow me, and you can decide whether or not you're going to fish for men. You know, follow me, and we're getting a replay over here. He said, follow me, and, and you, know, you might be a fisher of men. He said, you follow me, and you will be a fisher of men. You know what that tells me? That if, the old saying, if you ain't fishing, you ain't following. If you ain't fishing, you ain't following. If you're following Jesus, you're going to be a soul winner. Because you're going to have the heart that Jesus had. You're going to have a desire to see people saved. That's what Jesus, I mean, he said, I came to seek and to save that which is lost. That's what he was here to do. And if we're following in his footsteps, that's what we're going to do. We're going to seek and save that which was lost. You know, the people that don't win souls, they have the same people as, the, as those that sit out of church completely. They're not following Jesus. They're not following Jesus. I mean, how, you can't read these passages and tell me anything different. <clears throat> Look, the command is to go. Go back to John 15 and we'll close here. This is the, the real irony of, this, of, of people that want to go to John 15 and say, well, I'm really glad that you're going out knocking doors, but do you have any fruit that remains? Let me show you the irony in that. <clears throat> you know, my command is to go. That's it. The results are kind of out of my control. You know, I go out, we preach the gospel clear as we can. If people want to hear it, they'll hear it. If people want to believe it, they'll believe it. And by the way, that's why I don't get all sad when we, come, when we all get back in the van and no one gets saved. You go to some unreceptive neighborhood, right. Right. I, I'm just as happy as if I got 10 people saved. Would I rather 10 people got saved that day? Yeah, but that's out of my control, and I'm not going to sit here and bite my nails over things that are out of my control. 
Because I can't make people get saved. But if I go and I open, I say, hey, would you like to know? I can show you. You know, and if I go forth, you know, with weeping, you know, and, and I'm there with the right motive and the King James Bible in my hand, and they've been given an opportunity, well, that the ball's in their court at that point. And I'm not going to feel bad about it. I mean, I'm sad they didn't get saved. I understand that, but I'm not going to feel like a failure. I'm not going to feel like, well, I must not be committing, you know, I must not be obeying Jesus. No, the command's to go. To go. Once you've done that, you're a success. And the results are in God's hand. And here's, the, and here's the great thing about it. If you go long enough, you will get somebody saved. We all go through dry spells. We all have seasons, you know, where, where, where Brother Corbin's taking us in this neighborhood where nobody, you know, it's unreceptive. <laughs> like I have a map that says receptive, unreceptive. <laughs> well, I think we'll go there for a while. Like, we don't know it's unreceptive until we get there, folks. All right, so lay off me. <laughs> but even then, you got to think about it this way. You know, if we go, if we only go to the receptive area, let's say we only go to the poor, right? Which we should do. I think we should go to the poor. We should go to the poor first. And we should go to the poor multiple times because they're the most receptive. They will receive it. But does that mean we just completely discount the more wealthy neighborhoods? I mean, this is, we're not really there yet here in Tucson. One day we will be, so let me just you know, brace for impact. We're going through it up in Tempe. We've knocked all the poor communities over and over and over and over. Some of the most, the poor areas like Guadalupe have been knocked literally seven, eight, nine times. And the law of diminishing returns, eventually you get everybody saved that's going to get saved there. Everybody that's open and that, to the gospel and will get saved is saved. And now even that poor neighborhood it's unreceptive, not because they're cold-hearted. It's because everyone that's going to get saved is saved. <laughs> Eventually, you have to move on to the other neighborhoods. And can you really say we fulfilled the Great Commission if we don't preach to every creature? Because that is the Great Commission, isn't it? To preach the gospel to every creature. Not creatures in a certain you know, economic uh, you know, status or whatever. Not people who make a certain amount of money or are below a, you know, a certain threshold. Of income. No, he said every creature. So you can't say we as a church have completed the Great Commission if we have not done that. Which means eventually you have to just grin and bear it and go out and not. We're going to have to go over there across, what is that, Silver, uh, Silver Bell to the neighborhood. Who was You were with me, Brother Gabriel. We went up there that one, one Thursday night and it was like, we can wait on this neighborhood. <laughs> There's other neighborhoods, you know. We'll, we'll get here eventually, but it was just, you know. The, 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 you know, the, the tough thing about Tucson is there's a lot of, I believe, I think this is right, there's a lot of old people. You know, and I'd say that respectfully. You know, worse than, worse, as I've been told and I've, I've found to be true, worse than wealthy people is old people. You know, and there, that's a whole other, you know, the, the more receptive neighborhoods aren't always, you know, everyone thinks all oh, the, the, the people who are super wealthy are so unreceptive. Actually, it's, it's more like the upper middle class. People who, who are feel like they, they've kind of, they, they haven't quite made it to where that money's just a, not even a thing for them. They're still, they have never got quite there. So they're kind of, got to kind of look down on other people to make them feel like better. This is true. If you, if you go long enough, if the unreceptive areas are not, you go into like the mansions, the people are at least nice. They're over it. They're just kind of like, yeah, we made it. We got nothing, you know, whatever. They're just happy to be living life, whatever. But it's the people that have just been working really hard and just sacrificing everything to make as much money as they can and they just haven't quite got to that level. Those are the unreceptive ones. Anyway, I don't know where I'm going with that. But what I'm saying is this, is that I, the command is for us, it, the command for us is to go. And if we do that, we will bring forth fruit. And that fruit is promised to us to remain. Not because we, you know, we followed up on it and taught it, you know, the, the next 12 steps of the Christian life, or got him baptized, that fruit's going to remain whether or not those things happen. Are you in John 15 again? He says in verse 16, he says, I, You have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that ye should go and bring forth fruit. That's the irony there. People go, well, I'm glad you guys are knocking all these doors, but do you have any fruit that remains? Well, here's the, here's the thing about that. If you want fruit that remains, you have to go. <laughs> People that are all about getting fruit to remain. You know, we want fruit that's going to remain. Are you going? Well, are you going? 
And, and it's just the, the hypocrisy and the irony is, is that the people that are most critical of, thing, of what we're doing as a church here are people that aren't even going at all. They don't go at all. They haven't knocked a door maybe their entire Christian life. And why is that? Why, you know, and that's why they're so critical. It's because of the fact that when you walk into a church where it's actually doing the work, it's a lot easier to just kind of go, eh, well, you know, it's not fruit that remains, though. And just blow it off. Because then you can walk out and say, and that's, that's why it's okay for me not do it. Because you know, anyone in this room that goes knows that when you go, it's work. <laughs> it's a lot easier to just be critical and just say, well, that's not really what we're supposed to do. You know, we're just supposed to practice lifestyle evangelism. Well, I'm glad you guys are doing it, but obviously it's not really working because look how small your church is. You don't have any fruit that remains. Maybe you just don't want to go. Maybe that's the problem. Maybe you go, well, that looks like a lot of work. Uh, no thanks. That's what's going on. Because here's the thing. You can't bring forth fruit if you don't sow any seed. Well, I want to be fruitful. Well, you better go out and sow some seed then. You better go out and you know, get the broadcaster out of the shed, put some seed in it. And by the way, the broadcaster, you know what a broadcaster, the spreader, sh you know, broadcasts, right? The seed, you know, what that, you, know, you know what that is? You know what that tool is? You. You're the broadcaster. And you need to put the seed in. And then go let the Holy Spirit push you around the neighborhood. Shh, and spread the seed. Because if you don't do that, you're not going to bring forth any fruit. And you know what? That's your choice. And go ahead and be that way, but don't ever come in this church and start to question whether or not what we're doing is biblical. Because it is. And I'm not sitting here sweating bullets. Oh, do I have any fruit that remains? One, I'm looking at fruit that's remaining every time I get up behind this pulpit. And two, I have the promise that if I go out there and preach the gospel like I'm commanded to do, that I will bring forth fruit and that God says, and I'll keep that fruit. It will remain. It will abide until the day you come up in glory. And I'll introduce you then. You know, I believe that if we go out and we're faithful for decades, I'm saying years of our lives, just knocking doors, there's going to be people that we get saved that we forget. We don't even remember. And then we're gonna, they're gonna, you're going to be up in heaven. Some of the guys go, oh, thanks for coming to my door. Like, who are you? Well, you came to my door and, you know, April, you know, whatever, June, and August 30th, 2020, you came to my door on a Sunday afternoon and you preached the gospel to me. Well, I didn't see you in church, though. <laughs> oh, did you get baptized? Are you sure you should be here? <laughs> Jesus, I don't think he belongs here. He, didn't, he wasn't in church the following Sunday. He wasn't in church, in, he wasn't in church that night, getting baptized and reading his Bible every day afterwards. Look, you, you, anyway, I don't want to go off on it. What I'm saying is this, is if, we, if we go out there and we, and we win souls to Christ, you know, they're going to be waiting for us in heaven. Because God has promised that if we, if we preach the word, there will be fruit that remains. Let's go ahead and pray.